Would God not communicate to his creation what he wants from us, why he created us? Would that not be uh, expected of God to do? Or do you think God would leave people in, in confusion where people make their own destiny? Into, like, I think God wants me to um, just eat a, um, smoke a cigar and be happy and that's it. And some people say, no, God wants me to enjoy my life. Go around girls and boys and drugs and rock and roll, kill, doesn't matter as long as it makes me happy. Nothing is beyond the control of our Creator. The Creator is ultimately in control yeah. of everything. Yeah. He has given us laws to be in this universe, yeah. to operate, and that's why we're able to breathe in the air, and out of this air, a certain portion of this air, we're able to utilize it for our breathing apparatus, our lungs, and then taking oxygen from there, and that oxygen then somehow with the hemoglobin in our blood and so on, circulates around and we get energy, okay? There's an energy conversion, we need energy to stay. So all of this set in place, there's nothing within this universe, which is, you will say, it just happens without the creator knowing it, but outside his control. But there are certain things which we don't have control of. We have a limited amount of free will that yeah. we operate. Look, I can wish now to fly, but I can't fly because I don't have wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? So just because I wish something, it's not gonna happen. So there are limitations to what we can will and so on. So will that we're talking about, the will of God, of our creator, is ultimately the ultimate will. Okay? So no, nothing can happen unless our creator wills. So if somebody has something, for example, you know, let's say you say, you know what, I'm going to meet you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And tomorrow you wake up at 11. Okay. It wasn't in your control. So if God doesn't make your will into reality your will is not manifest into reality yeah you could not meet if, so I when you said if if something happens in your life like let's say something bad happens in your life would you blame it on god or would you blame it on you sure because we would never blame it god why it's like because look, there's intern because there's like two different types of of how people think there's internal external like control so if your internal you you will take responsibility for action and something happens to you you can say yes it's my fault um like it's because of my action that this happened and there's some people who are like actually it's out of my control like this happened like and like it's out of my control like god wanted it to happen like what type of person are you do you take responsibility for your action or would you just be like yeah it's just because god wanted it as muslims we take responsibility for our actions okay. the good actions and the bad actions we don't ever and we should never blame God okay. because certain things can happen with the will of God as a test. Yeah. So God said, tells us clearly, like, do you think he created you and he was going to leave you like this without testing you? Yeah. He will test you, see whether you are in good in, 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 in actions or not. Because he created you for a reason, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that reason is to, to worship, to glorify, to thank, to praise, show gratitude to God. Because okay. in that depends on our future abode, whether it's going to be um, a life of eternal happiness and joy and tranquility, or it's going to be a life of misery and suffering, pain and so on and so forth. We can make the destination based on our belief and our actions. So God, often in our life, He wants to make us develop and progress yes. in this journey of ours, and He will test us and see whether you are patient and whether you are grateful and thankful or not. Okay? So constantly there will be either from a loss of life, of wealth, of crops, um, certain things here and there. We've got certain in the Quran. It's just to test certain people. And certain people, as, as you are alluding to, they just say, Ah, oh, I can't take it anymore. Why is my son dead? Um, and the doctors couldn't save him and they, they disbelieve in the Creator. So that shows their faith that they're supposed to have 
had on solid foundation were so weak. They are not even grateful that God gave them all of this and he can take life like he gave life. God is the one who's given us life and he will be able to take it. So why are we then saying, oh, well, God's taken the life? It wasn't in ours to begin with. To give an example, when, suppose I died as a child, would you think my parents would have the ability and the power to give me life again? No. So they did not have the ability to give me life in the first place then. Because if they did, they can give me life again and again every time I die. So the life itself is not something that our parents give. It's not something Mother Nature gave. God, our Creator, Originator gave us life. And He made us not to live forever in this life. Do you think anything, anyone lives forever? Animals? So there's a program. I'm sure you know about that. There's a program in our cells in which we're supposed to die to apoptosis, program cell death. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah why would there be people living till they're 500? Yeah, yeah. So people are trying all their best to not to age and to live forever and ever. There's a whole science to do that. They try to preserve their body by cryogenics and so on and so forth. But still, you know, they're not being successful. So oh, yeah. the, the death was there for a reason. So that within this lifespan, we can fulfill our purpose. You know that? So when I talked about the creator, the originator, we are sure, you, you, you're positive, definitely there is a creator, there is an originator, right? And the originator must have created us for a reason. So if that reason is to worship our creator, how are we going to worship him? How are we going to be grateful to him? Imagine you love someone so dearly and you want to thank them and express your love to them. And are you going to? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Well, some, 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 some people in religion they pray. Some people go to church. Some people go to mosque. There's different ways people do it, and different religions do it in different ways. But I also think that, for example, a lot of people, for example, I'll take Christianity for a second because I'm Christian. Um, a lot of people, for example, Christians will go to church on Sundays. But if a Christian doesn't go to church on a Sunday, people are going to be like, oh, you don't worship your God, are you a true Christian, blah, blah. But I think actually in every single religion, like, you don't specifically have to go to church or a mosque or whatever to worship your God. I think that you could do it at home. Like, everyone, everyone can express, like, their love to God in different ways and it doesn't have to be going to a symbolic place, like being in your room or whatever, like everyone can do it in a different place and I think that there's not only one way to do it, you know, and I think a lot of people get criticised for that. I agree with you partially and I will tell you what, what part I agree and what part I disagree and then perhaps you can tell me whether, okay. you know, why do you disagree with some of the parts. But the point I was making about how do I express my love, my praise to someone, imagine he wants to express love to someone, right? Let's not identify what it is. Someone you love so dearly. And you love football so much. And you said, you know what? I'm going to... My boots that I have, football boots, that I have played every single match and I've won. So precious and so dear to me. I know it's smelly. I know it's filthy. I know it's now, it's, you know, different parts around here and it's breaking apart. I'm going to give this to my dearest person. But you know, your dearest person doesn't like football. Every time you put a telly on, oh, now look at this, I have to bear this. Doesn't appreciate football, but you do. And he said, there you go, opens up the present and it's a football. They might understand that what you're coming from, but if you think about her perspective, you'd say, you haven't made the right choice. Why? You should have asked or you should have even inquired. What does she like? And appreciate so when we talk about worshiping God thanking God glorifying God we need to be sure what God accepts imagine some people it's so disgusting example so I apologize um, from the very outset Channel 4 aired this many years ago maybe a decade ago I still remember it vividly there are some gurus in a Hindu tradition they were baking their own feces and eating it as an expression of love to God do you think in a reasonable mind that God appreciates people baking their own feces and eating? How, how will you know what God appreciates and what God no, no. doesn't appreciate? Good, good. Very good question. This, that means we need to know, right? We can't... Not but you will never know. Yeah. Um, we can only know if God tells us what he appreciates. But God cannot tell you because he's up there. Ah, let's dis discuss this matter. Would God not communicate to his creation what he wants from us? Why he created us? Would that not be 
uh, expected of God to do? Or do you think God would leave people in, in confusion where people make their own destiny? Into, like, I think God wants me to um, just eat a, um, smoke a cigar and be happy and that's it. And some people say, no, God wants me to enjoy my life. Go around girls and boys and drugs and rock and roll, kill, doesn't matter as long as it makes me happy. Doesn't, who cares about consent? Who cares about harm? It makes me happy. That's the way I'm going to express my love to God. So God, we know, is not going to leave us in this confusion. A God who is all wise, who has given us knowledge and wisdom in our lives, it makes sense that God would communicate to us in terms of what is expected of us. And we say, this is the form of communication. God, our originator, throughout times, over history, different places, has communicated to the people by appointing a spokesperson they're called prophets and messengers or warners telling them to convey to the people this is your purpose in life this is who i am and this is what is expected of you if you do this this is the consequence if you do that that is the consequence you would say that makes sense and that is fair because someone tells you imagine now standing here police comes and arrest us and say you know what we have to put you to a prison, maximum security prison, minimum 12 years. And you say, for what? Because you're speaking here in public. You'll be questioning, since when was there a crime? I didn't know. I had no news, no nothing. No one told me. I haven't heard anything from anywhere. No police ever told me. You'd be questioning. You'd say, that's not fair, putting me in prison just like that. Because any punishment to come, you need to have a pre-warning about it, like, okay, this is what the punishment is going to be for, for that crime. That's a fair thing to do. So God, to punish us for not doing something, or doing something, it would not be seem to be fair unless we know exactly what is required of us. Okay. Do you follow so far? I follow. Yeah, so this is what we're saying. To know how to worship God is not what I make of how I think I should worship God. Is when the Creator tells me yeah. this is why how I'm going to accept your worship. Yeah, but you're saying the Creator is going to tell you how to worship Him, but if you can't technically communicate, not me personally. Okay. The Creator will, saying, and, as He has sent or raised, appointed human beings to be prophets and messengers, and each of them they had their evidences as to how God has made them a prophet and a messenger. Because anyone could come along. Imagine, imagine someone comes along and says. I am a prophet of God and he tells me to give you your earrings and your money and your phone and you know your businesses and your house keys and everything. You're going to do that? You're going to say, how are you a prophet of God? What evidence have you got? So you, we, we expect, exactly, we expect something as a matter of evidence or proof from those spokespersons who claim to be prophets of God. When they establish that, that I am a prophet of God and you can see there's no reason to disbelieve in me because of the evidence I brought for you. You would then say, now I'm confident to accept what you say. Because I now trust you to be a prophet and a messenger of God. When you go to a doctor, you go in trust already because there's no reason to distrust that he's a... But if you already know there's some fishy thing going on about this surgeon. And you hear from other people that this man or woman didn't even go to a medical school, didn't get a degree, never went and passed his exams, or fake, you will be very suspicious you would not trust that person, isn't it? So, a prophet and messenger is examined like that, their life, their character, and then you say, I now affirm and I, and I and accept you are a prophet of God. So if you bring the Quran, and this is an evidence from God that this is his revelation or communication, then I know I can trust this book. And if God says, worship me and don't worship idols, don't worship trees or stars or moons or planets or anything in creation. That's written in this book, okay, very good question. If this book is evidently demonstrated, the, evident, evidently demonstrated. How can you be so sure that all of this is true? Very good question. And this is exactly the nature of the Quran demonstrating itself to be true. Because some of so, it might be a lie, and like during like no. centuries, things may change and people might have stuff, take That's away things. How do you know that this is actually like facts, you know? Yeah, this is a very good point. So let's talk about firstly, how do we know it's changed or not changed, right? So the Quran has been transmitted from the first person that was given to the Prophet, yeah, 1444, five years ago, 
It's about 1400 years ago. Yeah. It was transmitted through memorization as well as in write, written form. We now have manuscripts from within 100 years of this time. So many manuscripts across the globe, in private hands, in museums. There's one in Birmingham University, right? Birmingham Library. There's one in Oxford. There's one in Cambridge. There's one in Vatican. There's in Russia. Everywhere around, manuscript because Quran was transcribed and copied in large numbers so that people can have access to everywhere. It wasn't like a certain clergy had in control and they will only preach from there and you just listen and whatever I want to tell you and I, I have control, it was not. It was in the hands of people. So it was transmitted like this and you can go back now and look at the Quranic manuscript and you can see, yes, you can read the Quran as you read the Quran today. Yeah. Do you believe everything written in science? That's the point I was going to answer. Yes, I do. But how I do that is, 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 is the mechanism I'm going to um, share with you. And you follow everything in this book? I try all the best. As Muslims, they should. So some people, sometimes we fall short because of our weaknesses. So because of our desires and our shortcomings. But always then we repent to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I will try to mend myself. This is what is expected of us. Because we're not like someone who is, you know, so perfect. We are meant to strive towards perfection. That's the whole idea of our life, of our journey. That you try to strive towards perfection and doing so, if you fall short, but you admit and confess that you have done something wrong and immediately turn to God, He will say yeah, He accepts your repentance because He knows your weaknesses. So the transmission was through memorization as well. So if I were to now tell you that any chapter of the Quran, if I were to read it to you in the Arabic language as this Quran is, and if I make a mistake, you'll find so many people correcting my mistakes. You can go to any mosques, when they read the Quran in their prayers, they do you know five times a prayer Muslims pray. The morning prayer, Fajr, Maghrib and Isha, the three prayers, they read it aloud, the Quran. If the Imam who's leading the prayer makes some mistakes, so many people from the row, back and so on, even a young child will correct that mistakes. That's how the Quran is being protected because Quran has been memorized. Do you know how many hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people have memorized the Quran? Word for word, letter for letter, and they don't even speak Arabic. Millions of people, yeah? So at any one time, if you go to Muslim countries, there are special memorization schools where they memorize, yeah? So I can bring someone who is a seven-year-old and they memorize the whole book. I can't do it now, it's so difficult for me. I tried, right? I'm trying you know, make a supplication for me. But I'm saying you can bring a seven year old who memorized the whole Quran. So you can go and trace this back a year before, a decade before, 100 years before, 200 and all the way go back. This is a living tradition. Here in Germany, in China, in Philistine, anywhere in the world, people have always in every generation memorized the whole book. So that's why we can be sure that the Quran that we read today is the Quran that the Prophet left behind. Now, how do I know this Quran? All of it is from God. Because when I examine this book, you can be sure that the Quran has provided certain falsification tests and still stands to that test unfalsified. You see, if a book gives you some test of it, and you can say, if you do this, that's definitely not from God, then he will say it's not from God. To give you one example which you appreciate is, do you think a book from the Creator will contain mistakes? Of course not, because he's all knowledgeable. The Quran says so. If a book was, if that book, this book, the Quran, was from other than God, you will find many discrepancies, many inconsistencies. Well, you have a criteria. If this book has shown some mistakes, discrepancies, contradictions, you will say, I'm sorry, this book is not from God. One criteria of falsification test. Another criteria of the Quran says, if you think this book is not from God, what you have to do simply, Produce a chapter like him to. If you can't do it, go and help. Ask for help from your supporters, your your people who can. And this is where the challenge is. Look here. And if you're in doubt about what we have sent down this Quran upon our servant, Prophet Muhammad, then produce a surah. This is a surah. Each 114 surah or chapter. Okay. Then produce a surah like thereof and call upon your witnesses, as I said, supporters other than Allah, God, if you should be truthful, if your doubt is true, right? But if you don't do it, and you'll never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is people and stones prepared for the disbelievers and give good tidings to those who believe and 
to righteous deeds um, and do righteous deeds that there are regardless and on which this river flow and so on. So there's a warning and there's uh, glad tidings for people who believe in it. So the Quran tells you in this in a very second chapter at the very beginning, if you are doubtful that this is not from God, imitate something like it. Now this is a profound uh, falsification test the Quran offered and it's still being offered today to falsify. People keep on trying. The Arabs at that time were masters in the Arabic language. The Prophet Muhammad Islam, they knew he didn't go to school to read and learn and they knew he couldn't even read or write, let alone compose poetry. So when he brought the Quran with rhymes and rhythms, yet not prose or not poetry, and Quran says bring something like it, you'd expect them to able to imitate it. You know you can imitate Shakespeare, Chat GPT can do it. Yeah, you can imitate anything in terms of literature, music and so on. But you cannot do that. I made a video about Chat GPT imitated in the Quran and it admitted he can't do it because of the objective nature of the challenge. Yeah? So if you type in Chat GPT and the Quran and uh, you will see my video coming up. It is not possible for even artificial intelligence, let alone human beings, to imitate the Quran. Why? Because of the structural construction that the Quran is given, the speech where you can imagine the speech of the Creator. He made it in such a construction that no one can imitate it. It's difficult to appreciate because literature may not be your forte. But if I were to give an, an, an analogy, maybe it can help uh, to understand. You see these kind of building and structures that you see, right? If you are an architect, you are one of the best architects, a good professional civil engineer, architectural engineer, you're the best in town. And somebody says, you can't make a building like mine. You can't make a bridge like mine and so on. You say, why not? What is so difficult about it? Because you should, you should be able to make it. But what if they show you, this is how my building is. It's made of bricks and stones, but each one of the bricks is floating in space and not touching with the other bricks. Imagine the whole structure is like that. Every stone is actually floating with other, other bricks on left, right, up, down. No, not, nothing touching. You can take the brick in and out like that. It's holding the whole structure. You as an architect, can you imitate something like that? You can't. Because you don't think no one has the, the science and the technology to make something like this, even though it's made of bricks. The Quran, the structure of this language, was constructed by the Creator in His speech in such a way, even though it's composed of Arabic letters, alphabet, alphabet, but it cannot be imitated in that composition. That's the challenge of the Quran if people disbelieve it. So when we as Muslims can see in practice people are failing to imitate anything like it, the Muslims can have this confidence to say the Quran is from the Creator. Yeah? Because of how it is demonstrating itself time and time again that it cannot be made by, composed by anything other than the Creator. I've just given you two examples and there's many other criteria. That's how our confidence in this book is like that, that I have to trust and take everything. So even though the Quran says like there, God created, the, the Creator put angels responsible for transcribing what we do, good and bad. Imagine an angel here and an angel there. I can't see the angels, but I would trust because I know anything, everything else the Creator says, I will say this is the, this is the, this is the truth, right? There's no reason to, to doubt about it. So once you know something that is verifiable and you verify it, anything that is of the unseen, you can trust and rely on it. This is, this is a take of the Muslims in which we say Islam is true because it's self-evident of its truthfulness. As a Christian, for example, we don't say Islam came as a different religion. Islam came with the same religion that came with, but because things have changed, people corrupted the message of Christ, corrupted the message of Moses, peace be upon those prophets, and that's why you have people now worshipping Christ instead, or, or saying God puts a rainbow in the sky because he needs to remember. These are people's corruptions. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate the knowledge. Yeah? You take care. I appreciate it. Thank okay, you, you take care. Okay. It's all right. I, it's a different explanation, another, but um, it's a sign of respect to a woman when we don't shake hands, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Okay, no but this is for you, by the way. Take one. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank take you. care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I give you a